Okay, great. Um, our uh, clerk representative, Danielle King is here. She'll go ahead and call roll. Yes, um, Vice Mayor Burt. Here. Board President Dara. Here. Board Member DeBrienza. Council Member Tanaka. Here. Three present. Thank you. Uh, Chantal Cotton Gaines, Deputy City Manager and Staff Liaison to this lovely committee. Uh, we'll be choosing a chairperson today. So in the first two agenda items before that happens, I'll just be uh, leading the meeting. So first is oral communications. Madam City Clerk, are there any public speakers? Yes, um, if anyone would like to speak on an item that is not on today's agenda, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or press star nine. And we have one public speaker so far, Ms. Rebecca Eisenberg. If you can unmute yourself, um, let's see. You will have three minutes on the timer. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you for allowing to, me to speak at this meeting. Um, I am, am excited that um, so many of you are present in order to um, discuss and hopefully, hopefully improve the state of coordination of communication between these two um, groups of public leadership. Um, as um, I don't think either of you would, groups would either know, but, but except for individually, but I, I attend and usually speak at um, every single meeting for each of your bodies of leadership. Um, I am a public school parent um, in this district and have been for quite a while. In fact, I can say that my family represents, um, I think, uh, what is likely to be the majority of people who move to Palo Alto, who move here in part because of the fantastic reputation for its public schools. And um, I think also part of the majority of people in this district who have been extremely um, dissatisfied and disheartened with the state of these public schools within the past, um, increasingly so, over the past um, several years. Uh, I think that one of the reasons I ran for city council, um, a campaign of which I'm proud because I did receive 8,000 votes um, and I'm really happy for that as a first time candidate and um, is because of my passionate belief that there needs to be better coordination between the city council and the school district. One of the things I'd love to encourage you all to do is to attend each other's meetings. Um, hey, school board people, the city council meets generally every Monday night. Um, hey, city council, the school board meets um, every other Tuesday night. And so usually they don't overlap. I can't imagine that this um, particular short meeting would do justice of maybe just even attending and hearing public comment. But in the 49 seconds I have left, I just really want to urge the both of you to discuss what's about to happen, um, most likely with Castilea. Castilea is a purely private educational body that offers zero of its you know, millions of dollars worth of resources to the public or the community in any way. It um, keeps its extraordinarily Tony um, educational resources under lock and key, doesn't open up any of its facilities, share even with communities of need, like communities of color in the, who have been excluded from Palo Alto for decades, centuries. Um, City Council is about to give Castilea millions of dollars worth of, de of development assistance while our public schools str struggle. Please talk to each other about that. Thank you and stop it. Please don't do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Eisenberg. If anyone else in the public would like to speak on an agenda item that it, or an item that is not on the agenda, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or press star nine. And we have no other speakers. Thank you, Danny. The next item on the agenda is approval of the December 17, 2020 meeting minutes. And ordinarily, uh, people who weren't on the committee previously wouldn't uh, or would abstain of some sort, but I don't think we have the numbers if that happens. So I'm just offering that out there that you do need three of you for those to pass. Um, I have one quick change that I wanted to point out. 
Um, near the end, uh, when it's talking about XCAP, there is a reference to the PTA Council. And for someone taking notes, they might not know that by that we do not mean the lawyer for the PTA, we mean the Council of PTAs, C-O-U-N-C-I-L. <laughs> um, so it's minor, but uh, it's, um, it's the PTA Council with a, with a CIL, not the lawyer. Other than that, I move that we approve them as is with, with just that one change. Chantal, I do have the question on what you just, uh, the issue you raised since uh, two of us were not on the committee. Uh, I'm not sure that it's proper for us to vote unless perhaps we had viewed the meeting and I did not. Yeah. I'll second uh, DeBrianza's uh, motion. So we've only got the two of us. We we need a majority to pass it, and we only got two of us here. Yeah, I I can um, uh, view the meeting uh, prior to our next meeting, and then I think that's proper to uh, to uh, then vote in affirmation of the minutes at that time if that works. That was going to be my recommendation. Was let's hold off until next month, and I'll do the same. All right, so we'll, we'll table our, our motion in second, but hopefully it'll go through fine by next meeting. That sounds good. Thank you all. The so next item, most important item of uh, right now is selection of your committee chair. And we alternate each year uh, just for context between the city and the district. And last year, the district uh, had the committee chair. So with that, I'll open it up for nomination for chair. I'll, I'll move to nominate Mr. Burt. I'll second that nomination. Thank you. Any others? All right, let's move for a vote on that. Uh, there's been a nomination for Mr. Burt as chair. All in favor, please respond. Oh, we have to do a roll call vote. Sorry, clerk, call the vote, please. Yes, um, Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. Board member DiBrienza. Aye. Board President Darop. Aye. Councilmember Tanaka. Yes. This bill has passed unanimously. I see there's and a with, public comment. I am so sorry. Pretend the vote did not happen yet. Um, Clerk, can you please open it up for any members of the public who would like to speak? Yes, of course. Um, if any person or anyone from the public would like to speak on this agenda item, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or press star nine. And we have Ms. Rebecca Eisenberg as our first speaker. Ms. Eisenberg, you have three minutes on the timer. If you can unmute yourself. Hi again. So you know, it's not personal, but I will be speaking during this during this meeting. Um, what I want to say here is nothing personal against Vice Mayor Burt but we are facing a time of crisis um, in our leadership where lack of representation by people of color and women. And I just think it is, I think we need to be more mindful of, of diversity and inclusiveness in our leadership. Um, you know, it's, it's I, although I, I have been surprisingly, um, you know, based on, you know, being an opponent during the race, you know, pleased with a lot of the things said by Mr. Burt. Um, I think we need to recognize that we are in a crisis of, of racial equity in our country. And we, every single position of leadership that we choose, we need to be mindful of representation of role modeling, of inclusiveness. Um, um, it, Vice Mayor Burt already has been appointed to many, many leadership roles within this community. I think ideally we would choose a woman of color for this role since there really isn't, since there isn't a woman of color in either organization that is here, one that, you know, none exists on the school board and his none is here, the one that exists on this city council isn't here, at least can we have a person of color, you know, as a leadership 
um, or a woman. I actually think that council member Tanaka might be the best fit for this role because he at least has children in the public schools and is the only one to do so on the city council. So that's that's my thoughts. Thank you for considering, even though I know it's too late and Mr. Burt will be confirmed anyway. Let's just try to be more mindful about this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eisenberg. If anyone else would like to speak on this agenda item, please raise your hand or press star nine. And we have no other speakers. Thank you. So formally, can we please call the vote? Yes, of course. Uh, Vice Mayor Burt? Yes. Board President Darab? Yes. Board Member DiBrienza? Council Member Tanaka? Yes. This vote has passed unanimously. Thank you so much. And with the conclusion of that item, choosing a chairperson, I will turn it over to you, Vice Mayor Burt, and Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before we uh, proceed on the next item. Um, I just want to say I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, the opportunity that this committee presents in this really important year and how we can use this committee to really strengthen our commitment to the shared um, value of, of serving our youth in our community. And I think um, that that the committee has uh, a, a potential to uh, really lead on that and, and strengthen this in a way uh, greater than we have in a long while. So I'm really enthusiastic about uh, what we'll do this year. So uh, having said that, um, I, the next item is a brief update of superintendent comments and the city manager comments, um, uh, specifically listing the update on the 21 day Habit Building Equity Challenge and the COVID-19 Coordination Update. Uh, and I don't know uh, who would like to go first uh, um, amongst uh, uh, Superintendent Austin or um, uh, Assistant City Manager. Um, actually, I'm gonna turn it over to Chantal and maybe she'll go first and then Don can, can weigh in. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Um, so I will just give a few items for the city and then I think the 21 day habit building equity challenge we've had the chance to work with Ms. Yolanda Conaway at the district so I'll use that as a segue to turn it over to Yolanda and Don for district updates. Does that sound good Don? Okay, great. So the we just have two items. Um, one is the uh, bikeway project, we had staff present at the most recent board member about the uh, bikeway project along Churchill Avenue. And uh, it was a good discussion at the board. So just wanted to point out that that's happening and we'll be bringing that discussion back to the board um, soon. <laughs> so we'll have a specific date, but I just wanted to point out that the conversation is happening and good coordination there. And the other one is we like to make the reminder that uh, COVID testing is still available. And uh, Monique would have some additional details about the specific dates and locations for that. But just reminding the public that that is a resource that's available to use as we are continuing in the state of affairs that we're in. And then lastly, going into the 21 day equity challenge, uh, we had the opportunity to partner with both youth community services and the PTA Council and um, PAUSD for a great opportunity for the conversation around equity in our community with the 21 day equity challenge. And so I'll actually let Ms. Yolanda Conaway at the district provide an update on where we are, how many people are participating and what we're really seeing and a reminder that tonight is Thursday Night Live. Thank you, Chantel. Uh, good morning and thank you for having me here today. We are actually on day 18 of the 21 day challenge and I have to say it has been an amazing um, coming together of both community, uh, um, broader community of Palo Alto and the school district. We currently have close to 2000 people signed up. Um, there's a really amazing and reflective posts that are showing up on our Padlets. Uh, so I am pleased to say that we are living in a community that cares and is concerned about this work and, and would like to move forward in the work. 
um, we have uh, created a, a dedicated opportunity for us to really start talking about some issues in our broader society. Um, but this also has offered us an opportunity to really talk about um, some of the areas of, of, of need that we see in our very own community. Um, so uh, just recently we had uh, um, some segments on um, specific Pal Palo Alto housing and redlining and issues of that sort. There was quite a lot of surprise from our community that this, some of these things happened in our very own community. So um, the creation of awareness is, uh, in my opinion, going to help us um, open up a discussion about how we can, we can um, improve and, and move forward in our work around equity. So I, I'm, I'm so pleased and I'm so pleased with the city's partnership and YCS as well. Uh, I think we have uh, curated a set of um, opportunities for our community to really engage in um, some deep conversations that may not necessarily be comfortable, but necessary. Um, so if, if we can open up a conversation about um, how race impacts experiences, uh, I think we will we'll all be a little bit more compassionate. So tonight is Thursday. Every Thursday we have Thursday Night Live. Uh, this is a particularly special uh, event because we are going to be hearing from our students tonight. Uh, and, uh, there's a, a group of students who will be uh, answering some questions about their experiences in both our community and in our schools. And uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from them. Uh, ultimately, they're the voices of the future, but they're also the voices of experiences right now. Uh, so uh, we look forward to that. I don't know what they'll be saying, but uh, I'm sure there will be a lot for us to learn from that. We also have uh, tonight, uh, Pastor Coloma Smith, who will be speaking on, where do we go from here? Um, you know, we've, we've, learned, we've learned some things, but what do we do with all of that learning? Um, because some of the information is extremely heavy. Uh, so he's going to help us unpack some of those things and, and talk us through some next steps that we can do as a community, um, you know, to really engage a little bit deeper in the conversation. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, the final closing because we have a big celebration. 21 days is a long time, um, but it's definitely not enough time to actually, uh, you know, shift practices and change the way people believe and think. Um, but it is a, start, a conversation starter. So we're going to end uh, our 21 days on the 24th uh, with a uh, guest speaker, uh, Joe Trust from Culturally Responsive Leadership, who will be talking to us about um, moving away, moving from an allyship to, a, to being a co-conspirator. Like how are we uh, in some way proactively and actively engaging in activities that um, shift our culture? Um, so we are definitely looking forward to that as well. And that's for me. So I'll tell just a couple quick things for the group. First of all, how exciting was that? Beat PG and E, right? That that never happened. So uh, we were able to resolve with PG and E and and move that one right down the line, literally somewhere. So uh, very excited about that work and the community's involvement in that. Also, the rally around it really helped us. A couple just quick things here is I'm finished up my board item for uh, for next Tuesday. I have some stats about our school system as it stands right this minute in relation to in-person uh, instruction and services. So as of right now, before we bring another kid back, we have over 2,100 students back for in-person at elementary. That's the largest in our county. We have 120 students riding buses every day. We have 470 high school students back for athletic cohorts. We have 120 additional students back for targeted cohorts at the high schools that just opened up. Over, over 90 students, that number fluctuates a little bit for PAUSD plus. We're serving over 600 meals a day and we have well over 100 teachers back. Sixth grade returns on March 1st. Grades seven through 12 will return sometime shortly after March 1st, once we reach the red tier. We're open to the full extent of the law right now <coughs> and lead the county uh, as far as being open for in-person instruction in every category. So excited about our work. I'll tell you, it's not easy. It's not without uh, differences of opinion, but uh, our, our board of education made reopening and getting students back for in-person a priority and um, our, our teachers, our principals, our support staff are implementing at a pretty high level. So that's it for my update. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, 
there's just a, a, a few other uh, recent actions by the city council that I think uh, the committee might be interested in. Uh, one is that we approved a next bike plan element uh, that is to begin the process of uh, a, um, a plan to improve the uh, bike system on Fabian, Charleston, and East Meadow as it essentially the eastern part of those uh, areas as they feed into the new um, Highway 101 bike overpass and as they feed into the safe routes to school system going westbound, I'll call it southwestbound. Um, and so that'll uh, is just launching the design phase, um, but I think it it has a real value for uh, our youth and our community. Um, second, um, we last Monday had a study session on the uh, teacher housing uh, uh, program uh, by the courthouse and it received uh, enthusiastic support from the council. And so uh, jurisdictionally, uh, we don't have uh, uh, oversight on that because it's, um, from another governmental agency, um, but it it did receive strong support. And as you're probably aware, uh, we have $3 million uh, from our city affordable housing fund going toward it. <clears throat> and then uh, the uh, XCAP, the, the Citizens Committee on Rail has wrapped up their work. Uh, they're going to be presenting to the council uh, as part of an update on the uh, grade crossing uh, initiative, uh, probably over a couple of meetings, um, uh, that discussion will return to the council, but certainly of importance to the district is the recommendation of a majority of the XCAP is to close Churchill uh, entirely. Um, in addition, the uh, alternatives down at Charleston East Meadow have very strong bearings on uh, school uh, uh, bike commute uh, corridors in particular. So I know that the district has been extremely busy with um, all they've had to contend with over the last year and more, uh, but I just want to make sure you're aware that uh, this is moving forward to its next phase and it certainly has potential impacts on the district. Lastly, um, we had a meeting on uh, uh, where we are mid-year on the budget and kind of giving direction to our city staff on our coming year's budget. And there was a, a consensus on the council that we are going to be um, wanting to relook at our capital plan uh, to recalibrate it in the context of our, our current emergency and further deterioration of our uh, revenue streams. Uh, we have on top of a $39 million shortfall last year, another $7 million projected for this year. And the council <clears throat> really was uh, talking about wanting to look at how we can preserve uh, the most essential services that have had to be slashed um, and what unusual needs there may be that have emerged um, that are even greater needs as a result of the emergency. Uh, and despite our, our our funding shortfalls, how are we going to try to address those? So um, uh, hopefully that uh, gives you a, a sense of a few other items that we have and, and we look forward to um, engagement with the district on matters that, that overlap with your interests. And Chair Burt, uh, sorry yes. to interrupt. Uh, I just want to remind you that we do have um, public comment um, as great. well. And okay, um, uh, let's open it to public comment now. Great. Uh, we have one public speaker, Ms. Rebecca Eisenberg. Um, if anyone else would like to speak on this agenda item, please press star nine or raise your hand in the Zoom app. And Ms. Eisenberg, you have three minutes. You have been unmuted. Thanks so much. Hi again. Um, first of all, I really want to give um, many more props to Dr. Lana Conaway for the incredible work that she and her team um, did and continues to do with regard to the 21 day equity challenge. Um, 
I'm just going to go out on a limb here to say that uh, many of you haven't been doing the um, the equity challenge, but it's never too late even to um, join in even for one day. Um, and in particular, I really urge you, this doesn't take a lot of time, to just click on that link in each of the emails about the Padlet and read some of the incredibly passionate and articulate, um, courageous, um, personal comments that um, are always posted every single day, um, in, many of them from students and um, young, other young people, well, people of all ages in the community. I think it's just really on us, I speak as a member of the dominant cast, to, um, to take the time to learn about the perspectives and the experiences of um, individuals and, and groups who have been excluded by our historical intentional policies that have benefited the dominant caste. I think that I, I, you know, I just can't say enough positive words about this extraordinary program. And I hope that you all think about um, implementing it in, in greater, um, you know, try to bring, bring included in as many ways and as possible. Maybe even in each one of your board meetings, you could dedicate maybe 10 minutes in each meeting to maybe discuss one of the issues about experiences of exclusion and um, in our community and, and maybe how it feels for the individuals who have been excluded for, for so many years. In my one minute, I just wanted to touch upon some other issues that are relevant that the school that the city council has been working on that is relevant to the school district. Um, in addition to the fantastic work from Dr. Conaway, one again is I really, really think the school board needs to get on board before city council passes um, all of what's going on with this Castilea program uh, development. There's going to be a, a underground garage that will open and spit out on. Um, on Bryant Street Boulevard where thousands of, of, of young people bike um, every day. This garage will only be available to teenage girls driving their private cars. It's, it's just an accident waiting to happen to our young people. Also about the Churchill grade separation. Um, I wish Mr. Burt would have um, mentioned its impact potentially on busing and buses. Um, the Planning Commission just last week agreed to um, give away 25% of the retail space um, from retail to medical office. That's gonna impact kids and staff at Pali and other schools. City Council, don't do that. Um, also, um, I really need you all to get on board, get communicate better about Coverly. Um, there are 42 acres of unused land. I've heard Don Austin refer to it as a lot of stuff going on there. Um, ever since the city council terminated its $6 million lease um, last year, there is not very much going on there. And we need to use that land desperately and urgently. Please discuss Thank that. You. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you. And uh, returning, uh, we have a, a second part of this discussion of uh, the COVID-19 coordination update. Um, so so I, I'm sorry, I'm I don't sorry. have the, I, my Wi-Fi is down, so I'm working off my hotspot, so I'm having a little trouble here. But um, usually after the superintendent and, and city manager give updates, then the city council do and the school board does. Um, so I'm not sure if that's where we are right now or if, COVID we comes we could do it. I, I, uh, that sounds. We can uh, because they have it's broken down into uh, item four A and B, um, and um, uh, uh, before proceeding on the COVID part, then uh, please feel free to uh, have the floor. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, usually we just say what else is going on, and for the past year, we've pretty much said all COVID all the time, um, but. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention was the 21 day equity challenge. So I'm glad that that has gotten some attention here. Um, I have talked to so many people that are really excited to be doing it, that are grappling with some really tough things. Um, our family has been doing it for a couple of days behind. We've done it most days, but we, we know we've got time to catch up afterwards. Uh, and the content that is in there that has been curated is phenomenal. It's led to some really, really good conversations uh, with, you know, my 10 year old and my 15 year old and, and, the adults too. Um, so I'm so glad that, that this has been such a, a wonderful partnership that so many people have engaged in. 
Um, we are also dealing with uh, with uh, equity in, in a lot of different ways at school board meetings. Uh, I believe last uh, board meeting, Mr. Collins mentioned that we had recently seen the DF report. Um, we we got we got it recently for the first semester. Um, and good news, there are fewer people getting DFs <laughs> um, this year. Uh, I, I don't think we can attribute that to necessarily anything in particular. There's lots of reasons that could be, um, but it, we're we're very grateful that even in the face of many many students across the country really struggling and disengaging, we have fewer of that here. Obviously, it's still an issue that we are working on and need to continue working on. But um, it's a it's a wonderful sign that that we have fewer than we we typically have. Um, as Dr. Austin mentioned, we are open to the fullest extent we are allowed to be opened right now. We are preparing to open more when we are allowed to. Um, and at the same time, we pushed really hard for teachers to be added to the queue for vaccinations, which yesterday we found out that they are beginning on February 28th. Um, so hopefully teachers will at least get their first dose before they're spending a lot of time with students in, in classrooms. Um, and I think that's it. Sports. So yesterday was our first tennis match, right? So <laughs> our first competition this year. Um, I think that's it. I had another question about something that you said, um, Mr. Burt, and I don't know if we should wait for that or it had to do with X cap. Um, I, I can, well, I'll ask it now unless there's an sure. objection to that. Okay. Um, you mentioned that Churchill will likely be, well, it's recommended that Churchill be closed to traffic. Um, of course, that is true that it impacts our buses because our buses, our bus depot is at 25 Churchill and will will impact that tremendously. So that's something we need to discuss. Um, and I appreciate the acknowledgement that our our parents, of course, care very much, yet they're, we've been in crisis mode for 11 months. So there hasn't been as much engagement as we think there, there will eventually be, which is unfortunate timing. Um, I, I'm wondering also how that would impact the plans we saw for the bike changes to Churchill. Um, we saw beautiful renderings last time of of the way bikes would would pass through Churchill. And I'm wondering if there's any sense of how that would change or if it's too early to know. Um, so there are several alternatives um, uh, with, uh, in addition to the Churchill closure, uh, there was a minority of the XGAP that was recommending a, a further evaluation of a, a partial underpass. In either case, um, both of those alternatives include some pretty extensive uh, options on actually improving uh, bike pad access, uh, different considerations of a, uh, a bike pad crossing underpass or overpass at Seal and another at Kellogg. So those are still up in consideration, but I would say that they're they're prominent in uh, in the considerations and likely uh, whichever alternative is taken. Okay, thank you. That's it, at least for my part of school board. I don't know if Shanika has anything to add before we move on to our COVID update. I had, right. I had two things, uh, but are we, are we blending items four and five together? I don't wanna get ahead of, if we're only talking in the context of, of equity and COVID, I'll, I'll wait. You know, um, I was, um, I probably was off in blending those in essence. Um, uh, when I um, supplemented the um, uh, city manager's comments. Um, and so if it's all right, why don't we go ahead and, and uh, do that? Okay, great. Sorry if I, I, if I blurred that. No, it's my fault. I, I then have only two, two additional things to follow up on Jennifer's and, and Lana's comments about equity. Um, the other thing that the board did not took action on, but we had a discussion, a very, very deep discussion at a study session on equity and specifically the potential creation of a board committee tasked with oversight over the equity measures that the district is taking. Um, and that was a really valuable discussion, I felt, and I know other board members felt that way as well. So action pending potentially to be taken, but that's an update on, on the discussions the board's been having in that realm. Uh, the other thing too is just to follow up on Cubberly, we, the board did pass uh, action, did take action to allocate $1.5 million to modernize the I building uh, so that that will become a hub for special education services. And as you may remember previously, the board 
voted to allocate money to modernize um, or retrofit the A and B wings for administrative reasons. And so uh, it's my understanding, and Pat, we, we talked about this, that you know we've on our end appointed board members to the ad hoc committee for Coverly. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, I'm on that committee and looking forward to working with uh, whomever uh, Mayor Du Bois appoints on your end. Great, thank you. Um, and Council Member Tanaka, did you have anything you wanted to add on this subject? Not right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so then um, let's look back to uh, 4B and the um, uh, COVID uh, coordination update. That one we usually just kind of have in the updates that we offer already. So I think okay. I think we're good unless Don had something he wanted to offer. Okay, I'm looking at all the squares. Uh, well, but there's a question. Shining. I've got one thing on, on COVID coordination, um, just to highlight Dr. Austin or Don mentioned how the extent to which we've been open um, and serving students and families and our plan to continue doing so. Uh, and Jennifer mentioned the, the county's you know opening up of vaccinations. I just wanna underscore that despite the fact that we've been open and continue to open, we've had zero transmissions within our district of COVID. And so from sort of a public health standpoint on your end, I think it's important for you to know that the mitigation measures we're taking seem to be working very effectively. And if I can just add to that, um, I'm aware of the whole series of measures that the district has done to uh, make their facilities actually uh, healthier in particular, um, uh, drastically reducing the risk of airborne transmission through a whole bunch of uh, in capital investments in uh, engineering of your, your buildings from uh, air balancing to air filtration to advanced air purification. And um, frankly, I think that what you have done is uh, uh, really leading edge for our community. And if anything, I think it's underappreciated. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, by the um, by, the parent community, by the community at large, uh, and I, I really encourage you to uh, to get that out there uh, more widely appreciated because it's a, a model that I hope uh, both the private sector and the city will um, uh, follow. We're doing some of our own efforts, but uh, uh, we're not as far along as uh, the district is, and um, and I think it. Really, there's been far too little investment at every level. The federal government is now on the next uh, COVID relief package, uh, as you're aware, has uh, 120 billion, I think, toward schools, and a good portion of that is actually toward physical upgrades. Um, and uh, they, uh, uh, the president, just announced another uh, 60 or 70 billion allocated toward small business and physical upgrades toward indoor air. And I'm just really convinced that this is something that will benefit us even beyond COVID, um, not just uh, to help against the next pandemic, but the annual influenza and colds, and not to mention um, uh, uh, pandemic uh, mega fires and um, just uh, sources of asthma, of spores, and everything. We've been stuck in mid 20th century buildings where. Um, uh, the ideal was to have constant, steady temperature rather than air quality. And we're now in this transition that I think is going to be a huge public health benefit aside from the necessity today. So uh, I, I really encourage you to get the word out on what you've accomplished. Thank you. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think we uh, have now had the review of, uh, unless uh, other uh, recent board actions, I, I can take public comment on item five because it is listed as another agenda item, uh, even though we've kind of merged the two. Um, does, uh, are there any other updates on recent board actions? Guess not. For me. Uh, any, um, any members of the public wanna comment on five? even though it's kind of four and five were already merged. 
Yes, if I do speak on this agenda item, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or press star nine. And we have no speaker at this moment. Okay, thank you. So our next item is the Alcove presentation. And I'll just briefly and introduce, there's a team of people uh, and Jules will introduce everyone, but this was the last item that came from the city school liaison committee last year in 2020. We've been having a conversation related to the community economic recovery and particularly thinking about that community piece with wellness. And um, we have Project Safety Net present in December. And this is the follow up discussion of All Cove, which is also addressing um, youth mental health in our community. So, with that, I will turn it over to the team to do their presentation. And they are estimating about 35 minutes ish of their um, walking. Thanks so much, Chantal. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to bring you into our slide deck. Um, so. Um, just want to introduce our team, just going from the order on the slide deck. So, Steve, if you want to introduce yourself, and then we'll go from there. Hi, I'm Steve Abelsheim. Uh, I'm the director of our Center for Youth, Mental Health, and Wellbeing. I'll be talking a little bit more about Alcove. I was also a parent in the district um, for six years until my daughter graduated from Gunn uh, a year and a half ago. She now is going to college in our dining room table at UCSD, sort of. Catherine, would you like to go next? Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine Spears. I'm uh, with the Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Services Department. And I'm the program manager overseeing school based uh, behavioral health services, along with the Alcove implementation. Anna, would you like to go next? Sure, of course. Hola, buenos dias. Uh, my name is Ana Lilia Soto. I'm the Youth Development Manager here at the Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing. And I get the awesome honor to work with our youth advisory group members, um, and all of them are Palo Alto natives. So, um, Simran, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Simran. I'm 17 years old, and I'm a member of the Palo Alto Youth Advisory Group at Alcove, and I'm also the social media officer here. Hi, I'm Myra. I'm a senior at Palo Alto High School. I'm also on the Palo Alto YAG. Um, and yeah, I'm also 17. I'll pass it on to Stephanie. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm also on the Palo Alto YAG and I'm a senior at Palo Alto High School. Uh, and I'm so, so excited to be here. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, my name is Jules Vinova Castaño and I'm the Supported Education and Employment Specialist with Alcove in San Jose and in Palo Alto. And I'll hand it over to Steve. Thank you, Jules. Uh, good morning. I'm Steve Eckert. I'm the CEO from Allen Rock Counseling Center. Okay. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I just want to show a brief agenda so you know what we'll be talking about today, and then we'll get started. We're going to talk a little bit about Alcove history and implementation. Um, we're going to get a nice little um, view of the Youth Advisory Group. I'm going to talk a little bit about Supported Education and Employment Services, or C services. Uh, we're going to review Alam Rock's kind of coordination role and how we collaborate, and then we'll have a little time for Q&A. And so, uh, Steve, we'll hand it off to you for a little bit about Alcove history. Thanks, Jules, and thank you all for the opportunity to present this information to you this morning. I, I also want to acknowledge um, Matt Savage, who, who is here with us actually today from Supervisor Simidian's office, and Supervisor Simidian has been a great advocate and supporter for us in getting Alcove started, both in Palo Alto and in San Jose. And I want to also thank uh, Mary Gloner and the, and the folks at uh, Project Safety Net who've been great supporters and colleagues for our efforts and suggested we do this presentation with you today. So thanks so much for your time. As I mentioned, I you know, was a parent in the district from the time I moved from New Mexico to Palo Alto uh, now eight, and a half years, eight years ago um, till my daughter graduated from Gunn. And what, you know, what, we know um, about young people is that we are facing a mental health crisis and frankly we were even before COVID took place and as you know better than most uh, we have many young people with mental health issues we talk about how 50 percent of them start by the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 24 
But the reality is we still don't have the supports and systems in place for our young people to get that early mental health support. When we look at, you know, what are the primary health issues of young people between the ages of 10 and 30, as you can see on this graph, most of the most of the health issues of young people and morbidities are mental health related, which is why it's important that we have those early supports for our youth. Next slide, Jules. So, you know, as you may know, you know, um, the Stanford um, Child Psychiatry team has been a partner doing school mental health work in the Palo Alto schools for at least the last 15 years and have been very involved in working in uh, response to youth suicides and Project Safety Net and many other areas. And I worked for 15 years doing school mental health uh, before actually moving to Palo Alto and then dove back in during the second youth suicide cluster uh, in 2014, 2015, when my daughter was in eighth grade and I was working in the Stanford system. We really believe that school mental health is a critical component of care, but it's one important opportunity for young people. And as someone who was involved in this work for many, many years, it um, became important to me to go out and look for alternative ways of providing additional support in the community for these young people 12 to 25. So we came upon this model that was known as Headspace out of Australia. And we really worked hard with many of you, with colleagues at the county. We've been so grateful for our county collaboration with Catherine, Tony Tullis, Sherry Terrio, and others on building out uh, the potential for Alco sites within Palo Alto and in San Jose. And the idea is that with school mental health, with Alco sites, and with other specialized care, we're really creating a public mental health continuum for young people where there hasn't been one before. And what's important to also share with you that as we open these first sites in Palo Alto and San Jose, they're the first of these across the United States. Next. The services really are, are really to create a one-stop shop for young people. The goal is to create uh, integrated care with early mental health support, a place where young people can go to for early mental health issues without having to be in crisis, physical health related supports for adolescents and young adults. Jules will be leading our support education and employment program that he'll talk to you about. We'll have substance use support services, active peer support services, and then linkages to other critical services that young people and young adults will need. Next. This model is unique really by virtue of the fact that you see these young people here today who will be presenting to you. One of the key aspects of this model is really the youth voice and really creating a set of services and supports that are really guided by young people and a space that really is created and designed for young people to feel comfortable coming in and getting the early supports that they need and a very comfortable type of setting. The Youth Advisory Board, as you see people talking about being part of the YAG, is critical to driving the services. Uh, Steve will be talking about the community uh, voice and the community consortium that's also involved in helping guide the services. And the focus really on early mental health care and integrated care supports is really a unique and important aspect of this model that really has taken off internationally and now we're hoping to really kick it off across the United States by these first sites in Santa Clara County. Who's next? Um, this is me. Um, so to me, Alcove really practices inclusivity and to me it's very important to feel included um, in a safe space. And so the name all kind of comes from the idea that our spaces are meant for all young people, no matter what they're feeling or anything else. Um, and it really just communicates togetherness. And Cove, um, it conveys an open and safe space and it's a defining characteristic of our group and center in general. Um, the name came after YAG held focus groups with different youth in the community and then met with IDO, a data firm to confirm the name. The name was also vetted with different communities across the nation to New York and including Iowa. And it was 
meant to be inclusive as well as understanding of having the autonomy in service and support. Okay, so, you know, we recognize that sometimes to ask for help is admitting you're perhaps not enough of an adult to do it at all. And a young person's life can be a constant hum of things coming at them. And sometimes it can all just be too much. For young persons seeking professional care, this requires a leap over what may feel like a huge abyss. And youth struggle with mental hardship, but they rarely talk about it. So making the topic feel like an isolating form of failure doesn't really help. So engaging with mental health services often means going against family and cultural influences. And it can feel like to young people, everyone is trying to solve young people's problems, but in the end, no one is truly listening. Next slide, please. So as a way to prevent youth from feeling this way, a moment of pause is translated into every space of alcove. Um, you can see our three key moments here, and we ensure that youth understand what their services are. The YAG Youth Advisory Group have and will continue to work with ALCO, the team, and to ensure that there is transparency from being welcome to ALCO. And we're gonna make sure everyone understands and has services that are tailored to them and that we hire staff that will support them in those services, whatever they may be. Um, I'll be bringing it on to Stephanie. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the alcove space. So alcove will be a place to exhale and the center highlights a space of warmth, including the complexities of teen life, um, which honors the need for a dynamic space. One of the aspects that makes alcove different is that it's gonna be a non-clinical space. So rather than the white walls and medical field that's typically associated with health, the alcove center will have warm tones and greenery that will seem inviting, but still be realistic. And based on the concept of therapy, the cove will be a personal reset area with a variety of seating areas, textures and vantage points that really will facilitate that moment of pause. Um, and we'll also be offering a mix of hiding spots and open spaces to suit a variety of moods. And I'll be passing it on to Catherine. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, next slide, please. So I will share a little bit about the implementation and the implementation timeline of Alcove in Santa Clara County. So looking at these uh, years um, that we had started the discussion of Alcove, in 2015, we started looking at a feasibility study of, us, of an Alcove site, or what was known as Headspace model, and we did community convening meetings to gather community input. And in 2016, uh, Dr. Adelsheim had met with a Board of Supervisor Joseph Midian to discuss the headspace model and vision. And in, also in 2016, the County General uh, Fund was invested into this implementation with um, contracting with Stanford to provide technical assistance um, to include the youth outreach specialist position, position and a supported education employment um, position. In 2017, the project was approved by the Mental Health Services Act Stakeholder Leadership Committee, along with the County Board of Supervisors, and along with the Mental Health Services um, Oversight and Accountability Commission. And then also in Santa Clara, um, Santa Clara County became, and the Behavioral Health Department became the lead agency in 2017 with our partnership with Stanford at that time. We began the facility search of uh, the two, uh, two sites in Palo Alto and San Jose. And then in 2018, we were approved um, by the Mental Health Services Oversight Accountability and Commission um, to fund an innovation project. Um, the innovation component of this project is really to include a development of new um, best practices um, in mental health services and supports. Um, during, in 2018, Stanford also pursued the trademark and registration of the name Alco. In 2019, Alco became the official name the Board of Supervisors approved the leases for both sites. Um, in Palo Alto, it was approved on October 22nd of 2019. And then in 2020, um, we received um, the permit for San Jose. We also started completing the tenant improvement plans and designs with the Palo Alto site. We completed the furniture selection, um, the medical equipment selection, as well as the completion of a security assessment. We kicked off the community consortium meetings for both San Jose and Palo Alto. And we also kicked off a virtual program called Virtual U Navigating Wellness Online. Um, this was to provide supports and services during the pandemic um, to youth and young adults ages 12 to 25 
um, as we anticipate the opening of the alcove space. On November 20th, we received the permit from the city of Palo Alto and construction is to be completed in April of 2021 for Palo Alto with a site activation on May 14th. Uh, we will also be completing the site activation for in 2021 as well on June 1st. Next slide, please. So Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Services Department leads as the lead agency and coordinating um, all of the internal and external resources that, that will be implemented in the center. We will develop contracts, service agreements, as well as memorandums of understanding with other agencies um, and organizations to co-locate at this facility. And we report to the MHSOAC. Our partners with Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing are providing the technical assistance um, as uh, Jules and Steve mentioned, we have two advisory groups. The youth advisory group that supports with the, um, provides input and feedback along the implementation planning. They have also been part of our um, hiring process for staff and serves as um, interview panelists during those um, hiring processes. We also have the community consortium, both in San Jose and Palo Alto. And providers and subject matter experts are part of our team, um, our implementation team. And that is inclusive of Allen Rock Counseling Center, Santa Clara Behavioral Health Services Department, and Stanford Center um, for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing, as well as Valley Medical Center. And we are also contracting with Lucille Packard. Next slide, please. So this is a um, floor plan of the Palo Alto site um, from left to right. Um, that is the street Middlefield Road on the left. Going horizontal is Colorado Avenue. And this is at 2741 Millfield Road. So from left to right, we see the entryway of the space. Um, that is the lobby area. And to the bottom of that section is the reception area. If you go a little bit to the right, we see the um, on the top is the large conference room. And then on the bottom of that is the uh, flex space where youth can engage and um, have activities done at, the, at that space. On the top, um, three, uh, three rooms are the counseling rooms, followed by a restroom and then another counseling room. And then to the right of that last counseling room is an exam room. And the open or the office space on the bottom is where staff will be able to work. Um, so we have um, a number of seats available and available um, seating that is not, uh, is available to have others co-locate there as well. To the right of the office space, we have an entryway that will serve as a nursing station for vitals um, and um, documentation needed for the nurses. We also have a second exam room. And then followed by there's a L-shaped corridor. That is um, an entryway to our medical site where we have the medical prep room and soil room. We also have the wellness room there and a break room for staff. Next slide. Um, we completed a walkthrough on January 26th. So the frame uh, work is up at the site. Um, from the picture on the left, that's the entryway going into from Middlefield Road going into the center. From the picture on the right is the back entrance um, coming in from that corridor. So that's the view going um, to the front. Um, so the framework is up and we are working, or the landlords and the construction Team have been working diligently to get um, the, com the construction completed on time. Next slide. And I'll pass it on to Anna Lilia. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I get the awesome honor again to work with our youth advisory group members. Um, I'm actually going to have them share about YAG and YAG involvement, but I did want to say that they are part of the third year cohort, um, and we are actually going to start recruitment for our fourth year cohort. So after this, I will be sending Chantal um, some information that you can support um, in disseminating to different youth to make sure that they have this opportunity. And so for our next slide, I'm going to pass it on to Simran, who's going to tell you a little bit about the youth advisory group. Yeah, hi. So I'll be talking about the youth advisory group, as Anna said. And so as a part of the YAG, which is the youth advisor group, I'll be referring to that from now on, we ensure that there is youth voice at the core of all Alcove touch points and that each Alcove center has its own local youth advisory group. And also that intersectional diversity lens, 
such as people 16 to 25 years old um, that all have lived experiences are validated as experted experiences. And that engagement of youth builds a strong sense of community, that local GAG members allow you to make sure centers meet local concerns, and that we provide skills and leadership development opportunities for young people in the community. Now I'll be passing it on to Stephanie. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the mission of ALCO was developed by the inaugural YAG in 2018 and has aided all future YAG cohorts with direction, including our current cohort, and we wouldn't be here today without this. And through YAG, we ensure that each project, presentation, and any direction we head in fits with the YAG mission, vision, and core values. Um, our vision is to revolutionize mental wellness for young people through the initial focus on three core values, a youth voice, accessibility, and mental wellness. For us, youth voice includes promoting diversity, inclusivity, and advocacy. Accessibility for us um, includes normalizing conversations around mental health, promoting social justice initiatives, and educating our communities on wellness. Um, and lastly, our approach to mental wellness is a holistic, empathetic approach um, one that is free of judgment. And I'll be passing it uh, back to Anna. Awesome, thank you, Steph. Um, so I just really wanted to highlight the principles of youth participation. I think we've been getting glimpses through all of the speakers that have been able to share it. But really youth involvement is at the core of Alcove development. So the expertise when it comes to their lived uh, experience, including mental health, as well as you know being experts in youth and in their community, really lead the direction of Alcove in terms of the programs and services that we provide. And this dual relationship that we have with learning and leadership development really leads to a beautiful collaboration that is transparent in in our shared decision making. So everything that um, we go through with Alcove development really is vetted through the youth and not just when we focus on youth, we think of services, but we're talking about every touch point. And um, I know we're gonna hear about all those touch points later on, but cool, I'll pass it back to Stephanie. So in YAG, we strongly value youth voice as it's at the core of our mission. And youth, um, like myself, we see ourselves as a solution of support for our peers as we share similar lived experiences and situations. So seeing other peers vocal about mental health is a source of empowerment. Um, part of our engagement as youth advisors involves in developing leadership projects, including conferences, presentation, uh, advocacy, and summit. And we've engaged in trainings um, to support our role as youth advisors. One of the trainings we participated in um, was one partnered with the Santa Clara County Office of Suicide Prevention in Palo Alto University um, in a training called Suicide Prevention and Mental Health First Aid. And I will go to Myra. Thank you. Um, so through participating in collaborative design, consultation, and idea generation, the perspective of young people is threaded into Alcove's DNA. Um, youth inclusion makes sure Alcove effectively responds to the needs of young people, and the YAG is working with the Alcove team to ensure that centers feel youth-friendly and welcoming instead of feeling clinical and uninviting. In regards to advocacy, the YAG increases community awareness of mental health as well as Alcove services, through our networking, outreach, and presentations. YAG Youth will work with marketing staff to ensure that as many youth as possible become aware of Alcove and its services. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Myra. Um, I want to take the time now to talk to you about supported education and employment services, um, which, uh, which will be offered at Alcove Palo Alto, but also Alcove San Jose. Um, so I wanted to show you a document or a basically what I call a cycle of change um, that will be related to how we'll provide services at Alco Palo Alto regarding education and employment. Um, this model comes from the recovery model, um, but also comes from the mental health world. And I really like it because it engages youth where they are um, in their conversations around their goals. Um, so if we look at this circle, we can see that it's, you know, we can start at the top and look at it like a clock until we can go around and from pre-contemplation to contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and then learning experiences. But the way I really want to use this model is that, you know, young people come in with so many different experiences and so many different goals. Um, young people coming into Palo Alto, what I've heard from the youth advisory group, could be young people who are in college and they're looking to transition perhaps back into a community setting. Maybe they've had a hiccup at school, something's happened and they just want to know more, you know, what are my options? 
Um, another you know, type of youth I imagine coming in to the center could be a youth who maybe feels disconnected from school, wants to learn their options about reconnecting to school. And so what I would do in those conversations is kind of see where they are in this, in this scale, you know, in this cycle of change. And then maybe they're in that contemplation pace. They're really thinking about what's next. They have some ideas of what they want to do. And I can engage them in that conversation and get them ready for that next stage. Um, as I think about working with young people, and I think you know a lot of us do, or we have young people in our lives, it's really important to give the, them the information when they need it. So what we know about education and employment work is it's really important to get the information quickly to young people and help them meet the young people, the people in their lives that'll introduce the skills they need to go forward. Um, the last little piece I want to show you before I talk more about pathways into education and employment services is this learning experience piece. Um, you know, we all go through moments in our lives where we have a crisis, things go wrong, maybe there's a lack of resources, we're hitting barriers we've never hit before. And that's really what I want to offer for young people is that breath of fresh air to come in, talk about what's in the way, what are your goals, and how do we get you back on this cycle where you are comfortable and where you're ready to be. If you're ready to jump back into action and get right back to it, that's great. How do we get you there? If you feel like you need to start over and you need a little bit of help, you need to talk to somebody about how you're feeling, we're going to go there too. So pathways of services for education, um, employment or education services through Alcove Palo Alto. One will be academic advocacy support. So an example of that might be a young person who comes into the center and is just having a really hard time understanding how to get their transcripts or maybe how to send an email, um, a professional email to a teacher. Um, you know, sometimes young people just have a hard time navigating those sort of situations if they don't have somebody at home to talk to about how to do that, or if they don't have somebody around them, maybe that can help just coach them how, you know, how to advocate. Um, sometimes academic advocacy can look like connecting to resources in the community um, and also just helping them understand their rights as a student. If perhaps, you know, school of origin for a foster student is coming up for them, a knowledge of education law. Um, academic skill building support. I think this is something we're always looking for for young people is how do we build skills? How do we connect them to resources? There is an amazing array of online resources being developed um, in the remote learning environment. Um, but there are also, you know, are some amazing um, in-person resources that we can connect to um, on a low cost basis, especially in the Palo Alto area. But what I am really excited about too as well is engaging young people, having them identify where maybe they need to build skills and then developing those relationships with people on campus, like tutoring groups, maybe a math teacher is willing to connect somebody to that um, you know, connected resource on campus and then help them remove those barriers to connecting to those people. And working with young people, I find that sometimes they just miss the time or they have a hard time scheduling. And I wanna be able to connect those pieces for them around connecting to the on-campus resources. Academic placement support might come into play where a young person is getting disconnected from school. Maybe they're questioning you know, where they wanna go next. Um, I wanna provide connections to community colleges and local state and four-year universities. If a young person is coming in and asking me questions about financial aid, I wanna connect them immediately to the experts. I have some really great connections at Mission College. Um, Mary Fitzgerald is really wonderful over there, but there's this a group of financial aid experts who are really willing to give this information. And I think for some young people that can really relieve stress. Um, I wanna have strong and, and building strong connections to tech and vocational schools. Um, I've already met with um, several schools and kind of understanding what needs are. And then starting to meet, um, especially in the Palo Alto area with um, wellness centers. And so I've met with Jason. Um, I don't wanna say the last name incorrectly, correctly, but I'll just try Krasilowski, who uh, is the head of director of student services at uh, PAUSD. And I've also connected with uh, Kathy Lawrence. And so we're talking about how we can collaborate and what might be possible going forward. So employment pathways. Um, so there'll be education services and then there'll be employment services. And so employment pathways, um, again, will look like skill building, just like in education. I want young people to know that there are no dumb questions or small questions. Questions come in all forms. Um, sometimes it might be, you know, how do I fill out a job application? Or, you know, what if I get the job, how do I fill out the tax forms? I've had a lot of young people come to me and be really stuck and feel like that, that was a barrier to them getting a job. And I want there to be really simple ways for them to access that information at Alcove. Um, job seeking has just changed it's so much for young people um, in this new way of living. I have found that really we've really emphasized using online job searching applications like Indeed. Indeed is doing a lot to make things more accessible for young people. We know that some young people need to work to provide for themselves or provide for their family. And so if young people are coming in and they need help finding a job, they need help finding 
employers who are hiring during COVID, I have a pulse on that and I want to offer that space for them. I want to make sure I'm, and I am developing community connections to local workforce development agencies. An example of that in Palo Alto is job train. Um, I'm developing eligibility pathways and basically so that when a youth comes to me, I'm able to talk to them knowledgeably and then even collect groups of youth that I can bring them to outreach workshops and they're really job train is really willing to work with me on that. So that's really exciting. Um, I want to offer employment uh, connections to employment skill building, tech auto construction organizations, especially within community colleges. There are some amazing auto programs, culinary programs offered at Mission College, auto programs offered at De Anza and Evergreen Valley College. Um, and these are programs that connect to certificate and union based programs. And these are jobs that pay really well, are really secure, and are going to be needed in the future. So, connection to education and employment support. So, how do you get into to this support at Alcove? Um, you know, really the model, what Steve referred to earlier, this idea of a one shop shop. We imagine and we know that youth will be coming in and most likely talking to our peer support workers, which are young people who have, you know, mental health experience or live mental health experience themselves, but are also mental health professionals. So young people could be talking to a peer support worker or one of our clinicians, one of our doctors, or one of our intervention counselors. And inside of those conversations, if a young person mentions, you know, school's feeling overwhelming for me, or, you know, I really need to get a job. I think that's, that's what's stressing me out. That'll be a little flag to someone on the team to be, hey, you know, maybe I should make that introduction to Jules. Um, there'll be a referral process within the center. Um, we'll be communicating constantly. We'll be having check-in meetings, um, you know, weekly and possibly bi-weekly. And as well, if referrals want to come from outside the center, I definitely want to have an external face and my email, my phone number. If you know a youth or somebody that you know is um, in your uh, that you're working with and you want to refer them, I am definitely welcome to that as well. Um, so workshops and trainings are going to be a component that I also want to offer, and I look at them in three buckets. So soft interpersonal skills. I run into so many young people who are just having a hard time right now managing their stress. How do they calm down in an educational environment? How do they calm down when they're really upset with work? I really wanna give concise but helpful um, DBT related or CBT related um, coping skill model workshops that could be 15 or 20 minutes. How do you calm down in the bathroom really quick, bring yourself back and come back into the situation? That's an example of a kind of a workshop I wanna give, but I also wanna you know, branch that out into communication skills. How do you do job interviews and kind of interlace all those skills together. Education and professional skills. Um, I know that young people sometimes have a hard time identifying where the core competency gaps might be. Some young people are great at it, but I wanna approach those conversations with young people from a healing centered and resiliency building perspective, not what's wrong with you, but what's right with you and how do we build on that. Um, I wanna do resume workshops, hit them with specific skills. And then if I get a sense that a youth really needs um, that expert level professional um, support around resume and job seeking. There are plenty of organizations I can kind of scale them up to connecting them to based on those workshops. And finally, I wanna offer a component of parent and family workshops. Um, if a family, if a parent or a caregiver comes to me and they need a little bit of education or coaching around special education law, 504 IEP plans, which are plans that help support special education students. Maybe they need some support on how to even talk to their student in this COVID learning environment. I know in my home, this has been a struggle. Um, we've even had to move my son from working in his room into the living room, but just how do you problem solve around these things? How do you shake the tree a little bit? And you know, how do we have more rich conversations with our young people? Okay, so with that, I wanna hand it off to Steve, who's gonna talk about Alan Ruff. Thank you, Jules. And I'll just take a few minutes. I believe I'm the last speaker. Um, and so thank you again for this opportunity. Just quickly, Allen Rock Counseling Center has been around for 46 years. We started by a group of community leaders to meet the unmet counseling needs of youth in East San Jose. Um, since then, we've grown to a multi-service agency of staff of 85 folks, um, providing 13 programs including a mixture of clinical and non-clinical programs, including school-based behavioral health, mentoring, verse five, alternative activities, and other programs, including Alcove. Um, and our services are in schools and homes and in the clinic um, and in the community. And our mission is to heal families and to inspire youth to reach their full potential. Now we partner with this list of uh, folks that you City listed, including um, the County Behavioral Health Services, Stanford uh, Medical Center, and um, go to the next slide. Um, 
our peer support specialists uh, provide peer-based mentoring, individual and group emotional support, which is non-clinical, uh, navigation through our services, site tours, outreach, and other services. Um, our goals include helping youth feel uh, safe and supported, help them uh, raise awareness of services within the community and to link them to those services, uh, to reduce the stigma around mental health um, in the youth population and to increase early help seeking and to increase the youth sense of connectedness to family and the community. Um, and the population that we plan to serve is uh, Santa Clara County youth, age 12 to 25. And those who are seeking support of uh, mental health or emotional challenges, physical health and school and employment. Can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, now, our role in case management is non-clinical. Um, and while ARCC provides clinical services and other programs, um, we also, one of the reasons I like leading ARCC is we have a mixture of both clinical and non-clinical programs. With, with, uh, with Alcove, our role is non-clinical. And so uh, we'll link uh, youth to uh, community services. And this isn't just giving them information and referral, but actually giving um, a strong connection to other services. Also to advocate within Alcove. Um, sometimes it's a little bit complicated and we'll make sure that we're connect, connecting youth with the services within Alcove. Um, it's also youth focused. Um, we're consistent with uh, YAG input and our staff are generally young with lived experience and they relate well with youth. It's an integrated approach. Our peer support workers are part of the whole Alcove team. It's a team approach in a milieu setting. Um, the team members have defined but also flexible roles. And we coordinate together in regular meetings. Um, the peer support role is the coordination, coordination of case management to again, advocate internally, but link externally. And then also uh, one of our roles is activities. Um, uh, we have to have fun. If you're gonna work with kids, it's gotta be fun. Next slide, please. Part of ARCC's role is to, uh, to lead and coordinate the uh, community consortium. And so as any advisory board, they provide uh, recommendations and bring special skills and, um, and assistance to Alcove. Um, we bring in the uh, expertise and strategic skills um, from a variety of leaders throughout the community. And the memberships com comprised of the core representatives of Alcove plus um, about 12 other members from the community. Um, and we have one in, uh, in uh, Palo Alto, and of course, uh, a, a separate consortium in, in San Jose. Consortiums have already met three times. Um, and the first year they'll met, meet six times, and then we'll be, be meeting quarter, uh, quarterly after that. Um, the 12 members include uh, elected officials, um, including representation from Supervisor Samidian's office, Matt Savage, who's, who's here with us today. Um, Councilwoman uh, uh, Lydia Coe is on, is on the um, consortium. Kathy Lawrence from the school district is on the consortium. Community college representation. And then also representation from uh, other service providers who we will invite to provide services on the site but they'll also be members of the, um, the consortium. Um, next slide. And that's my, my part. And I think we'll go for quest questions and answers from anyone. Thank you, Jules. Welcome, Steve. Great. Um, maybe uh, we, we should uh, open up the public comment briefly, although we're, uh, we're running up against our uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, schedule uh, to be closed at 10 uh, and then um, questions from colleagues. So do we have any members of the public who want to speak? Yes, we have Miss Rebecca Eisenberg. And if anyone else would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or press star nine. Miss Eisenberg, uh, you have three minutes. You have been unmuted. Thank you so much. I'll try to be quick. Um, there was no packet um, that I could see linked from um, this agenda. So this is the first time I've heard about this program, even though I have a, a high school freshman and a high school senior. 
as my two kids. Um, and I have to say, this program sounds extraordinary. It sounds transformative and life-changing. Um, city, this, this, this is a message directed to city council explicitly. Um, you all have um, already made $40 million of budget cuts with another potential 40 million on the way or more. Um, you all decided to cut some extraordinarily important services for youth, including teen services, including children's theater, which is such an important outlet, especially for kids who are outside the box, um, such as my daughter who is on the autistic spectrum. And I beg you to, um, to financially um, assist and give any other support you possibly can to this program, which sounds extraordinary. Um, I have some background with this type of program. I worked for the Stanford Bridge for um, pretty much all four years when I was at Stanford. Um, I was trained as a peer counselor, as a suicide counselor. And I, um, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that I, I believe I saved three lives of, of students at Stanford when they called in um, with suicidal thoughts. That is a problem, not just for college students. It's also a problem for high school students and even for middle school students. As I said, I have two teens um, that I live with and that I love and cherish um, incredibly. Um, I also think we need to work harder on role modeling mental health services. When there was a debate for the 10 candidates for city council, myself being one of them, I was the only person who gave an answer when asked about how we handle stress. I was the only person who said I speak to a mental health professional. All nine others um, said doing things like going on runs or watching TV, we need to really wrap our minds around the fact that we're facing this extraordinary, unprecedented mental health crisis. And we need to embrace and role model the fact that mental health services can be life changing. And this sounds like such an extraordinary opportunity for our youth. Um, lastly, I just really want to um, point out, and I believe this is included in the model that there are, um, you know, all, you know, I'm sure you are doing this. This is to Alcove. You already have resources for LGBTQ um, IA plus. Um, and for marginalized um, individuals, um, you know, Palo Alto has a history of, of legally enforced um, racial exclusion, um, ethnic exclusion, and um, those uh, that exclusion will have um, mental health um, repercussions. I'm so grateful. Please, City Council, School Board, give them all our money. Thank you. Thank you. So um, at this time, uh, colleagues, uh, do you have uh, initial uh, comments and questions? Um, I'll just wait in um, then uh, I don't see anyone else. Oh, uh, Jennifer, sorry. Um, Greg had his hand up first. I don't know if you could see the little hand icon. No, there. I can not uh, I missed that, sorry. <laughs> go, right, go right ahead, Greg. Uh, so first of all, thank you guys for your presentation. Sounds like really important work. Um, so thank you for your service to the community. Really appreciate that. I was just curious, um, uh, and I have to, I have to, um, I have another meeting at ten, so I have to jump in about six minutes here. But if there are students who are interested in getting involved, um, how do they? I mean, either volunteering or maybe perhaps using a service. Do you? Can you guys speak about that? Sure, I can talk about it. Um, if youth act, it's a great time actually to want to be involved. We're starting the application process for our third cohort. So I can share my email and that's how I get a lot of youth um, who are interested in wanting to participate. It's Analilia, so it's my name at stanford.edu. Um, I'll make sure that Chantal has it to be able to share it. Um, and then um, with the application process, they can share their interests. We also have an ambassador program if um, maybe the YAG isn't what the commitment that they're looking for and they just wanna be able to participate, we can offer different opportunities. Thank you, appreciate it. And, and is it mainly for high school students or middle school as well? Our youth advisory group is actually from 16 to 25. Um, Alcove in general, when, once we open, services will be open for youth 12 to 25, but for our YAG right now it's 16 to 25. Great, thank you. 
And Jennifer? Um, that was one of my questions. So thank you for asking it, Greg. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for this work. It's really exciting that this is coming to Palo Alto and that it's gonna be another opportunity for students to just engage in a, in a meaningful way and get and hopefully get help and feel more connected. So thank you. And um, I'll just add that um, I'm just uh, in awe of the progress that has been made on this. And I, I since um, I recall meeting with Steve back in 2015 and 2016, as he was working on the concept, um, I did not appreciate how far this had progressed. And um, not only the facility and the great county commitment, um, but um, the uh, community consortium and the youth groups um, elements are uh, just seem like a, a, a really great foundation. Um, I'm going to be interested in understanding more about um, the community consortium um, and um, the, the formal or informal roles uh, and collaborations that uh, exist with uh, Stanford, PAUSD, and the city, as well as Project Safety Net. Uh, we may not have time today to go into details, although maybe Steve can speak to that uh, preliminarily. And then maybe we can have a follow-up because I think it really does warrant it. And then lastly, uh, just to share that um, uh, Mayor Du Bois has launched um, a uh, an initiative at uh, the beginning of uh, most council meetings for community partners to have uh, 15 minutes uh, to present uh, their valuable community programs and expose them more. Um, and I think that um, that could be an opportunity uh, for Alcove. And, and I also am going to be interested in how the city can help promote uh, this really great new addition to the community. Um, so, uh, Steve, if you just have a couple minutes to me, we can follow it up later, either offline or at a subsequent uh, meeting and, and have follow up discussions. Yeah, thank you, sir. I, you know, I'd, I'd be glad to follow up with you and, and see what more we can build in terms of the collaboration. As, as Steve shared, we have representation uh, from both the school district and from the council as part of the local community collaborative group and actually Mary um has also been involved from project safety net as well so within that collaborative group we have sort of those voices and and kathy lawrence who was you know also my daughter's last principal at gun we're really excited that she is is at the table working with us representing the uh, school district and um we'd be excited to look though at building on that collaboration in bigger ways and looking at ways to expand on the um, support and integration with all of you so I will follow up with you, sir, and, and look at what other opportunities there might be to take things uh, further ahead. Great, thank you. And um, I guess we're out of time unless anybody else, uh, I don't see any more hands up. Uh, now I'm looking properly at that uh, schedule. Um, so thanks again, that was a really uh, informative and Im really impressive um, presentation and um, just incredible progress that you've made on this. And we're really looking forward to um, the grand opening of your facility. Um, so thanks again. And I guess um, moving on to our final item, which is planning for future meetings. Um, uh, colleagues, uh, and, and first, I don't know whether staff had any uh, prospective agendas uh items and uh wanted to i see uh jennifer uh um, i think just as xcap continues to move ahead i think it's um i just think it's important that we elevate that issue whatever the standing is at, at each of these meetings and we can be sure to bring it back to the district um obviously as we said there'll be interest in getting more community involvement but um I, I think it'd be really helpful for us because there's so much going on just to make sure that's a standing update. Good, and and we would really welcome um, your participation at our upcoming uh, uh, both study session and action meetings uh, in the coming 
month or so actually. Okay, we'll make sure to uh, make sure that PTAC, the PTA Council knows, and that um, we talk here to make sure that that our our bus concerns or our crossing concerns or whatever are are presented, whatever the district deems to be the the issues that are that are relevant to us. Thanks. Great. Um, I see uh, Councilmember Tanaka had to drop off. Shanik, uh, did you have um, anything? Well, the only thing I'll, I'll add is you know to in line with with the goal of this meeting, um, having the two bodies continue to develop um, areas in which we both have interests and allocating some portion of the time in the meeting to discussing what those are and what those might be, um, I think would would serve us well. Uh, great. And on that uh, vein, um, can my screen be shared? Uh, you should just be able to share screen. Uh, Oops. If you push okay, the I need to go back to, uh, sorry, my. And Matt, did you have your hand up? Just want to make sure we didn't miss it. Talking about me? Yes. Uh, no, I didn't. But uh, <laughs> thanks everyone for doing this. This is this is fantastic. Such a great program, and I can't wait for it to open in just a few months. Thanks. Okay. And um, can folks see my screen? Yes. Okay. So this was um, uh, just a start of an outline um, that I put together. And I actually uh, was conferring with Todd Collins on kind of similar themes. And he had some good thoughts on how we might structure some of this, um, um, uh, how, to, how to get our hands around uh, all the range of existing and prospective uh, collaborations and relationships that we have. Um, and so if, if the committee is interested, uh, maybe we could schedule a first kind of preliminary discussion of this at our, um, at our next meeting and uh, go a little deeper into how we might want to structure the, um, uh, how we attempt to move forward on giving cohesion to the relationships. You know, we have just uh, a whole series of kind of uh, uh, not really connected uh, or uh, unified um, relationships, but a whole extensive network of them over time. And um, to, to look at them in a more strategic way uh, I, is something I'd, I'd really hope we could um, uh, try to get our, our, uh, our arms around this year. Uh, does that seem like a, an item that we would want to have on the upcoming meeting? I think it's worth having a conversation about, for sure. Great. Um, so we'll do that and uh, keep you updated on the um, X cap. Um, and if you have any follow-up thoughts on uh, uh, future agendas, uh, please uh, shoot, uh, uh, I guess, uh, Chantelle and myself an email. Um, and um, on that note, unless anyone has anything else, oh, Chantelle, please. Really, really briefly, um, there were a couple standing items that have been on previous uh, year's agendas related to Coverly and grade separation. So I'll work with you offline, Chair Burt, and we can discuss some of those. We left them off of today's agenda just because of the volume of things, but we just wanted to put that out there that that's something that has historically been on the agendas. Great, all right. Pat, we'll can you that. share this document with all of us so that we can yes. chew on it before the next meeting? Yes, I'd be glad Great. to. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks, bye. Thank bye. you. Bye everybody, thank you so much. Bye bye.